Welcome. Welcome to the Robert H. Jackson Center and to this extraordinary opportunity to meet and listen to an extraordinary man. First, the Robert H. Jackson Center was formed this year for the purposes of preserving the legacy of America's advocate, Robert Jackson. Hopefully you all received a one-page statement of our goals. We are a work in progress and we look to the community at large, the lawyers in specific, with regards to how best we can accomplish many of those goals. Secondly, I'd like to thank the Public Abstract Company, Frank Carroll, Tom Price, Christopher Flynn, and all the staff for collaborating on this special event. Where else can you get three hours of continuing legal education, a speech by an historical figure, and a free lunch? <laughs> Thirdly, thanks to Chautauqua Institution and Tom Ferri for encouraging today's event and making the Athenaeum Hotel available to our guests. To our guests, I am pleased to introduce Ambassador John Dolabois, and unfortunately his wife of 60 years who joined him at Chautauqua came down with a little bit of laryngitis, and so she's currently at, at Chautauqua. Normally she attends all of his events to make sure he uh, stays on a straight and narrow. I'll introduce Ambassador Dolabois shortly. Serendipity has played into our hands to be blessed by his presence today. A year ago, I was watching the History Channel concerning Hermann Gehry. There appeared John Dolabois, quote, Gehring interrogator. He appeared several times during the 30-minute piece. After the program ended, I was curious and went to the internet. And under people search, typed in John Dolabois. Press, boom, there's only one. Happens to be in Oxford, Ohio, and there was his phone number. As shy as I am, <laughs> I got on the phone, called him, and he was gracious enough to talk to me for about 45 minutes. I then thought it would be terrific to be able to interview him. I kept trying to find ways in which I could be at Oxford, Ohio. Little did I realize shortly thereafter, Tom Ferry, his brother Fred, called him. I do not know Fred, but I do know. His son goes to Miami, and through that connection got to know Ambassador Dolabois. He felt it would be important that the Ambassador Dolabois story be told and be given the excitement and, and be given that there'd be a great deal of excitement and interest at the Robert Jackson Center. Serendipity continued on. Richard Haig, a friend of Ambassador Dolabois, was at our July 18th Chautauqua Institution speech which was highlighted by Professor John Barrett. Mr. Haight suggested that Ambassador Dolboys would be perfect to come to Chautauqua. I was convinced. Also, I didn't realize that Mr. Hayden then had had conversations with you and learned that Ambassador Dolboys was going to be in Montreal on September 22nd to speak at an international conference. It was then I thought, man, it would be wonderful if he could possibly on his way back stop at Chautauqua and spend a couple of days vacationing of which we would exploit you. <laughs> I then contacted Ambassador Dolabois to see if he might make himself available for such an event like today. I must tell you that two weeks ago, Ambassador Dolabois advised me that because of the events of September 11th, the Montreal Conference had been canceled. Nevertheless, he vowed at age 83 to honor his commitments. I can tell you yesterday, Ambassador Dolabois and his wife drove seven hours just to be with us today. That's remarkable. Thank you very much. We're honored. <laughs> A quick bio of Ohio, Ohio University. He was naturalized in 1941, married to his wife in 1942, drafted and assigned to the Military Intelligence Center where he was trained as an interrogator. He was intimately involved in the rescue of the Lipizzan Stallions from potential harm by the Russians. And he just told me on the way down that uh, though uh, that he's part and parcel, uh, you'll see his personage in the Walt Disney movie, uh, should you ever have it in the rescue of the Lipizzan Stallions. After the war, he was assigned to the Central Continental 
prisoner of war and closure in his native Luxembourg for a role of which he will discuss today. After World War II, his life continued to be distinguished as he worked for Procter & Gamble and was active in the affairs of the University of Miami, Ohio for over 35 years. Mr. Ambassador, you need to know that there are several alums in the audience today, and I know you've met some of them. In 1981, he was appointed ambassador to Luxembourg by President Reagan, a tour of duty that lasted until 1985. He's the author of several articles, including a book, Pattern of Circles, which I would highly recommend you purchase and possibly have autographed later during the reception. I'm his agent. Talk to me. <laughs> By the way, there, there are only a few books left, so if you're interested, uh, don't wait. In order to put Ambassador Dillaboys into a time frame, indulge me in sharing the following film. I'm going to move this for a second here. Any kind of history buff. Uh, here you get a chance to listen to a guy who was there, who had a chance to interface with all the people you just saw on the film. And so I'm just exceedingly thrilled and pleased that uh, Ambassador Delavoy made a special effort to come here today to talk to us. Ambassador Delavoy. much for your warm welcome. <clears throat> uh, I really um, feel very privileged to be here and after that very generous introduction, in fact that's the most elaborate introduction I've ever received <laughs> with pictures and everything else. Now I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> but I don't want you to be the least bit intimidated by um, uh, all of the nice things that have been said because I I really don't let it go to my head. I learned a long time ago that no matter how important you think you are, there's always someone who thinks he's more important. <laughs> I can illustrate that with the story of um, Roosevelt and Stalin and Churchill meeting at the Altan during one of their important sessions when they were dividing up the world. And after their deliberations, they met in the evening to have a drink and their favorite smoke and they sat back in their private room and Churchill looked at the other gentleman and he says, uh, my friends, you should know that I, more than anyone else in history, has influenced the developments of the world in the first half of this century. Well, Stalin wasn't going to settle for that. He lit his pipe and he said, Niet, he said, the Lord God Almighty said to me, Joseph Stalin, you will rule the world. And Roosevelt lit his cigarette and took a sip of his champagne and he said, Joe, I never said anything like that. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here and I'm honored to be here because I have many good memories of this part of New York. During my working days at Miami, I used to come up to Colgate University quite regularly for a conference on American foreign policy, long before I thought I would ever wear the mantle of a U.S. ambassador. And of course, I remember eating dinner in that delightful restaurant, which I think is still in existence in Skinny Atlas, and I've camped in the Adirondacks, and I've enjoyed and appreciated the scenery around the Saran uh, Lake Saranac and Lake Placid and Tupper Lake, so I'm very happy to be back in this part of New York. Now, I'm not a lecturer. I'm not going to enlighten you about the, the woes and, the, and the, the problems of the world and their solutions. I'm a storyteller and I like to share my experiences. And I have, of course, a, a very unique story to tell about in answer to the question that millions of people around the world were asking themselves in May of 1945, when the war ended. Whatever happened to Goering? Streicher, Lai, Ribbentrop, Keitel, Jodl, Dönitz, all of the high-ranking Nazis whom we had seen on the covers of magazines and read about in the newspapers for the ten years prior to the World War, World War II. <clears throat> there was a lot of speculation because nobody knew where they were in the summer of 1945. There had been some talk about a trial going to be held 
to try them for their crimes that they committed. But nobody knew what had happened to them. And you could get your name in the paper by going to Rio de Janeiro and coming back and say, I saw Hitler driving a taxi in Rio. Well, somebody else saw Goering operating an elevator in Buenos Aires. And you always were assured of publicity by telling a story of, of that type. CNN hadn't been invented yet at that time, so nobody knew where the Nazis were. Well, as you've heard briefly mentioned in this uh, interesting script, they were all back in my native country of Luxembourg, under a great cover of secrecy. All of the Nazis still alive who had been taken prisoner by the British, French, the Americans, and the Soviets were now brought together under one roof in an establishment called the Central Continental Prison of War Enclosure Number 32. The army had a code word for it. They called it Ashcan. And the British had a similar processing center up north near Wiesbaden, and their odd code word was dustbin, <laughs> which indicates that somebody had a sense of humor, because we hold a lot of trash between dustbin and Ashcan, <laughs> so those were appropriate names. Luxembourg had been selected by the Allied forces for the location of their special detention center. Nobody could find Luxembourg on a map, it's so small. 999,000 square miles, uh, 260,000 population. Some people have said 999 square miles, why don't they give them another square mile and make it an even thousand? <laughs> and the Luxembourg has said we tried that once, <clears throat> but we couldn't teach them the language, so we gave it back to them. <laughs> <laughs> but Luxembourg was small, secret location, a little place called Mondorf Les Bains, a resort, a spa, with mineral water that could cure any illness, and massages uh, of all kinds and descriptions that people of Belgium, France, Luxembourg, of course, and Germany would come to Mondorf to take the cure. Baths that were invented and developed by the Romans 2,000 years ago. And that place was selected because nobody knew where it was, nobody could find it. Palace Hotel, the largest structure, a four-story hotel, became the headquarters of this detention center. We had a 391st anti-aircraft battalion, American troops who were the military police, the guards of this establishment. They protected uh, the environment around the compound of the hotel or the whole compound with a 10-foot barbed wire fence, machine gun tower in each of the four corners, 30 caliber machine gun, heavily armed guard. They kept the security, not so much to keep the Nazis uh, in as it was to keep the Luxembourgers out because to this spa, the Luxembourg government also sent the survivors of the concentration camps from Luxembourg those who had been displaced persons, those who had been in, uh, under arrest, mistreated. And they were sent to Mandorf to take the cure, to drink the water and to recuperate. And they were outside the fence. The people who sent them into their miserable situation, into the concentration camps, were inside the fence. And we had to make sure that those on the outside didn't get on the inside to uh, enact their own international justice. So we had a military guard. <clears throat> we had 42 German PW, handpicked from different PW locations, who were the cadre, the work cadre, carpenters, electricians, cooks, bakers, doctor, even two chaplains, Catholic and Protestant. We didn't need a rabbi for this particular group. <laughs> then, of course, we, we had the people who cleaned up the place, who, who were, they were, they were the work cadre. A very interesting group to study because they were the ordinary German soldiers who had been subjected to the Nazi regime and who are now in a position to live on a day-by-day -day basis with the high-ranking, the Bonzen as they call them, the big animals, the big ones. And then there were five others. They were members of the American military intelligence staff and I happen to be one of them. And I'll get back to that in just a moment. But let me explain what the purpose of this international prisoner of war enclosure was. Justice Jackson, as the chief prosecutor, 
and his colleagues from the other four countries who were going to serve as prosecutors, <clears throat> and the judges, one each representing each of the four countries, they decided we're going to try these men for crimes against humanity, war crimes, crimes against the peace. But our intelligence had been very poor during the 30s. We really know very little about the Nazis. We didn't even know what these different ranks meant in the SS. What was the SS and its purpose? What was the SA, the Sturmabteilung, the brown shirts and their purpose? What was the objective of the Hitler Youth, the NSKK, the NSKK, the National Socialist Flying Corps, the National Socialist Medical Corps, the National Socialist Motor Corps, paramilitary organizations which actually became the basis of the German Wehrmacht, the army. We didn't know how they were organized, what their order of battle was. We didn't know what their ranks were. What was a Sturmbannführer, an Obersturmbannführer, and an SS Reichsführer? We didn't understand those titles. We didn't know their responsibilities. And Justice Jackson and others decided before we could try them, we have to find out more about them so that we, we can at least interpret the terminology and understand what they, what they were doing and what their objectives were. And then finally, <clears throat> we had to know something about their personalities. Who were these men? What brought them to, top, to power and why? What was their background, their IQ, their personalities, characteristics, their weaknesses and their strengths? So it was decided to bring all of these prisoners who would be tried and those who would serve as witnesses for the prosecution and the defense to a secret location, Ashcan, in Luxembourg, where they would be interrogated and we would get the answers to all of these questions so that when the trial started in Nuremberg, we would have some basis, some foundation from which to work. And this is how Ashcan, the CCPWE number 32, developed and what it was all about. And under a great cover of secrecy because we didn't want to be hampered by uh, the press, the media. Uh, we didn't uh, want anybody to know where these Nazis were and why they were there. Now the first question then was, what kind of people did you get together? Who were they? Well, at one point, you saw the class of 1945, because eventually the secret leaked out, and Time magazine did come to Mundorf late in August before we broke up the installation, and they took the class picture, and they called it the class of 1945, with the class president, Hermann Goering, right in the front row. These men lived on the fourth floor and the third floor of the hotel that you saw pictured. The hotel furniture then we moved, replaced with a folding army cot, straw mattress, two or three GI blankets, a bucket of water, a cake of Life Boy soap, the original Life Boy soap, the kind your mother put in your mouth when you use bad words. <laughs> <laughs> they were not permitted to wear belts, neckties, shoestrings. We, we did compromise on the shoestring because they kept walking out of their shoes. So General Eisenhower allowed us to give them four inch shoestrings so they could at least hold the tops of their shoes together and not walk out of their shoes. No wristwatches, no eyeglasses. Those were kept uh, on the rack in a public room under guard. We were worried about their wanting to commit suicide. There were no door locks, no doorknobs, no screws, bolts, anything they could use. They had the freedom to move around the hotel. They could visit each other in their rooms, and they could come and visit us. The five of us who were the interrogators lived on the first floor. The second floor was a buffer. Nobody lived there. There was a buffer between the third and fourth where the prisoners lived. The ground floor, the dining room, living room, a lounge, where they could listen to an armed forces radio and read the newspapers that were available, very few of them, and they could socialize. There was a veranda in front of the hotel where they could sit and sun themselves. They could walk in the hotel gardens within a barbed wire enclosure. 
So they had that freedom, and that was by design, because by associating with each other, in a mingling, talking, arguing, it stimulated our interrogations, our information, because we had no difficulty getting information from them. Everybody was ready to blame everybody else, to put the blame on someone else's shoulders, to squeal on the other guy. We didn't do it, they did. I didn't have anything to do with it, he did. We had no problem getting information. Our problem was they were giving us too much information. We had to work overtime to get it all together. What were we after? We worked for the Nazi War Crimes Commission, Justice Jackson. They were located in Paris. They had a better location than we did. But they were preparing the case for the prosecution. They would prepare a brief, a questionnaire, about each prisoner as his name came up. And those briefs would be sent to us. And the five men who were the interrogators, the Nazi war crimes interrogators, would use those briefs as a guideline in interrogating the prisoners and getting the answers to the questions and then writing up an intelligence report on each prisoner, send it back to Paris, and that information would be incorporated in the material available on the prisoners to be used in the course of the trials. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse my voice. I think my wife gave me a little bit of that laryngitis before I came this morning. <clears throat> One thing more about the prisoners before we get to their personalities and also the personalities of the interrogators. 86 of them at the time we were operating at full strength. Because they had the freedom to move around the hotel, they divided into three distinct social cliques, little cliques, groups by themselves. On one hand, we had all the members of the German general staff, the Red Stripes, on the side of their trousers, the elite of the German army, whose history dated back to the time of Frederick the Great. These were men like the highest ranking uh, Field Marshal, General Field Marshal Keitel, the Chief of the Armed Forces High Command. His deputy, General Oberst Jodl, who was the Chief of Operations. Walter Wallemont, the Deputy Chief of Operations. General of the Artillery, a very interesting personality who had been in the anonymous Colonel Guido working with the Condor Legion during the Spanish Revolution in charge of the German army working with the, the Spaniards working for Franco in Spain. Colonel Guido was now General Walter Varlimont. Grand Admiral Dönitz, the commander and chief of German submarine warfare, Commander-in-Chief of the Navy, who subsequently was named by Hitler to be his successor when Hitler committed suicide. Grand Admiral Rader, the Commander-in-Chief of the German Navy. Uh, General Field Marshal von Blumberg, who had been a former Chief of Command. Von Rundstedt, the leader of the Battle of the Bulge. Kesselring, the Commander of German troops in Italy, who became the Commander of the Western Front during the Battle of the Bulge. Well, these and others were the members of the German general staff, the elite, the military, who helped to plan and execute World War II. <clears throat> now they were declassified prisoners of war. They were all together in a group. They wanted nothing to do with the other prisoners. The German general staff had their own little clique. They would sit together, they would eat together, and they would tell us all about the Nazis and about the others. Well, in the second group, we had the men like Julius Dreischer, the Jew Bader, the Gauleiter of Franconia, editor and publisher of this pornographic anti-Semitic newspaper called Der Stürmer, Robert Lai, the labor front leader in charge of the Arbeitsfront, a union, government union. You couldn't get a job in Germany without belonging to the Arbeitsfront, the labor front. Lai had more than 30 million members in his organization. Everything from ditch diggers, streetcar operators, to foremen in factories 
were members of the German Arbeitsfront. Fritz Sauko, the man in charge of slave labor, who provided more than five million non-Germans to work in Albert Speer's industries and mines to keep the war effort alive in Germany. Hans Frank, the butcher of Poland, governor general of Poland, who confessed the responsibility of signing the execution orders for more than two and a half million Jews in Auschwitz, Birkenau, and other concentration camps in Poland. Arthur Seiss Incourt, who betrayed Austria, later became the military governor of the Netherlands. Walter von Schirach, the Hitler Youth Leader, and of course, uh, Albert Speer, and others. The Alte Kämpfer, Rosenberg, the Nazi philosopher, Kaltenbrunner, the Scarface you saw, the man in charge of the Sicherheitsdienst, the security service. These were the, the old fighters who had helped Hitler come to power. They were the ones who joined him in a putsch in 1923 in Munich. And then, of course, are the ones who then also rose in the ranks and received the positions of power, who, who had the right to send people to concentration camps and to their death without trial. These were the, the real Nazi criminal element. They stuck together. Now, in the third group, we had the bureaucrats, <clears throat> the German government, the ministers, the secretaries, some of whom had worked for the Kaiser's regime during the First World War. During the Weimar Republic, they became social democrats and kept their plush jobs in the government. The minister of agriculture, the minister of this, that, and the other. They ran the government. When Hitler came along, they jump, jumped onto the communist, uh, the Nazi bandwagon, and became Nazis and kept their plush jobs. I venture to say that if they'd stayed there long enough for Stalin to come riding onto Den Linden, they'd have jumped onto the communist bandwagon. And they were opportunists. They went with whatever wind was blowing. Now they too were declassified prisoners of war, stuck together as bureaucrats the Nazis, the generals. As I said, we played them off against each other. And this is how we got our information. We didn't have to use any thumb screws, secret devices. We didn't torture them. And we just had to shut them up when they talked too much because they were very eager to talk. In fact, a man felt depressed if he wasn't being interrogated because in the eyes of his fellow prisoners, he wasn't very important if we weren't interrogating him. <clears throat> How do you get to be an interrogator? Well, I have to digress a moment here and, and tell you personally why I was one of five chosen out of some 11 million men in uniform. And it's a roundabout route to become an interrogator of the high-ranking Nazis. I was working for Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati after graduating from college. November 1942, and I received one of those letters from the late President Roosevelt telling me my neighbors had gotten together, decided to do me dirt. <laughs> and I was now in the army. I reported to Fort Thomas, Kentucky, which was the induction center at that time. And I'll never forget the young PFC who sat behind the table there in the personnel section. <clears throat> he looked at my papers when I came up in line and he said, well, the Lapis, what can you do? Well, I've heard my name mispronounced, just that kind of a name. But I thought he was overdoing it a little bit. <laughs> and I proceeded to correct him. And that was the first mistake I made in the Army. <laughs> he looked at my papers, and then he shuffled the papers and said, hey, look, just because you spent the college, don't expect me to get literary at you. And then, of course, <clears throat> I took all the wind on my sails. <clears throat> but in answer to his question, what I could do, I said, I was born in Luxembourg, and um, I could speak German and French fluently, and I'd like to get into military intelligence. He said, did you ever drive a truck? <laughs> I, I, I said, no, but I can speak, speak German fluently. I wasn't going to give up so easily. I said, how about a bus or a tractor or a plow or something heavy with air brakes? I said, no, but I can speak German fluently. <laughs> Well, by that time, my minute and a half was up. 
And two days later, I found myself on a troop train on my way to Fort Knox, Kentucky, where the Army made a tank driver out of me. <laughs> now, I was inducted on a day they needed tank drivers. If I'd been inducted the day before, I'd gone to Cooks and Baker School in Texas, or maybe the artillery the day before. But on that day, I became a tank driver. I was a square peg in a round hole, and I applied myself. I became a good tank driver. I drove every vehicle in the armored force. I fired every weapon in the armored force. <clears throat> I completed my basic training, and in due time, was chosen for OCS to become a 90-day wonder. I went to officer's candidate school in Fort Knox, got my first demerits from no less a person than General George S. Patton, Jr. <laughs> Patton was the commander of the 8th Armored Corps, and I was, I had a, a, a bunk mate in our OCS barracks, uh, David Del Pilar from the Philippines. David Del Pilar and I, and I have to brag a little bit here, were the only two who had gotten through OCS so far without any demerits. Nine weeks and no demerits, the only two in the class. And we were getting kind of cocky. But our sergeant said, hey, when General Patton makes the inspection, everybody gets a demerit. And sure enough, General Patton came. I passed the barracks inspection. He had white gloves on, he checked the dust on the window sill, the works, and I passed. He got to David Del Pilar, and David had done a good job of cleaning up his place until the general looked him in the eye and said, how many pairs of socks in your footlocker? And Del Pilar had to guess, seven. The general said, two demerits, improper inventory. It was 11 pairs of socks. <laughs> he got his two demerits. We both passed the uniform inspection with flying colors. Then the last thing was the rifle inspection, and I knew I had it made. My boy was clean. You could suck a milkshake. Uh, uh, through, through that bore. I came to present arms and the general grabbed the rifle and spun it, looked through the bore, then he flipped it back at me and we always kept a nickel. Those of you who have been in basic training, you keep a nickel in your rifle to hold the spring down so you can drive the bolt home. That nickel mysteriously popped out and landed at my feet and the general said, what is it, heads or tails? And I said, <laughs> <laughs> you know what's coming. I said, tails, sir. Two demerits, moving in rank without permission. <laughs> and that was a good omen. <laughs> My first contact with General Patton, and there were a few others after that. He was the commencement speaker when I graduated from OCS, and I was in the mechanized cavalry, and because I, it was a cavalry commission, the general pinned the sabers on my, uh, my uniform, and I knew I was off to a good start. I was assigned to Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, 16th Armored Division. Camp Chaffee is one of our national shrines. And that's where Elvis Presley did his basic training. But when I was there, it was just another camp, 16th Armored Division. And I had decided I'm going to fight the rest of the war in the Ozark Mountains against the tarantula spiders and whatever else they have out in Arkansas. Then, lo and behold, Somebody stuck a pin in the right hole, my card dropped out, and the army found out that I could speak German fluently. Consequently, on three hours' notice, I was mysteriously assigned to a secret camp, Camp Ritchie, Maryland, where the army trained its military intelligence personnel. Eighteen months later, after being inducted in the army, and eighteen months after the army spent a lot of money training me, making me an officer in the mechanized cavalry of a 16th Armored Division, I ended up where I should have been in the first place, in military intelligence. My specialty was IPW, interrogator, prisoners of war. For two months, I went through a crash course, learning all about German army organization, as much as we knew, order of battle, the rise of national socialism, and the techniques, the psychology of getting people to talk when they don't want to talk. At the end of the two months, I was to go overseas as a member of an IPW team. We would interrogate prisoners taken on a battlefield in order to get the information that we wanted. But then again, somebody had found out that I had been in the armored force, 
and I'd fired every weapon and driven every vehicle. So they decided I would be a better teacher than I would be an interrogator. So I became a teacher, training others to be interrogators. And as a teacher, you learn a lot more than you do as a student. Consequently, I became a specialist. <clears throat> and when I did go overseas, I did tactical inter uh, strategic interrogation instead of tactical interrogation. Strategic interrogation means we, were, we interrogated only general officers or scientists, or those who had worked on the V1, the V2, chemical, bacterial warfare, atomic research. And my uh, job was to go around the different PW camps and to find out what prisoners were in that category and then to bring them to a secret location we had in the Ardennes in France for detailed strategic interrogation. Werner von Braun was one of my first prisoners that I was locating out of a prison camp in Augsburg and brought to Ravin for detailed interrogation. We were also looking for uh, Victor Heisenberg, the atomic uh, physicist who was the atomic expert in Germany, whom we suspected, along with Friedrich von Weizsäcker, who was working on uh, the atomic bomb. We wanted to beat them to the draw, so we wanted to locate him. We didn't. He was in Switzerland in hiding. Well, when the war ended, my commanding officer called me in, and he said, um, Dollar Boy, we have a new place for you. You're going to a place I've never heard of before. It's called Mundorf Luxembourg for Special Detention Center. I haven't any idea what's going on there. Well, by then I was pretty smart. I knew the Army. I didn't tell him I was born in Luxembourg. That's where I wanted to go. <laughs> <laughs> I kept my big mouth shut because if I had told him, I probably would have ended up in the Philippine Islands. So, so I ended up in Luxembourg, not knowing what I was getting into. But that's how I became an interrogator at the Special Detention Center in Luxembourg. And I arrived there <coughs> in the Jeep, saw the barbed wire fence, saw the machine gun towers. I had never seen a PW camp, so I heavily guarded. And I asked the sergeant of the guard, I said, what kind of a place is this? You know, what's going on in there? And his answer is very typical. This is Captain, he said, don't ask me. He said, I've been here three weeks and I've never been inside. To get in here, you have to have a pass signed by God, and somebody has to verify the signature. <laughs> well, they let me in. I had the right papers. And they didn't let me out again for a whole month because of security reasons. Later on, they did find out that for, in order to prevent nervous breakdowns, we had to get away once in a while. So we were billeted in town. But for the first month, I was one of five interrogators living with the Nazis in this palace hotel. Now, how did I find out what was going on there? Because nobody had briefed me up to that point. I was assigned to room number 30. I was in the process of unpacking my belongings. When I heard a knock on the door, I thought this was one of the other officers coming in to introduce himself. I opened the door and got the surprise of my life. Before me stood none other than this guy you saw in a gray uniform, still with medals, he clicked his heels and bowed. He said, Göring, Reich Marshal. I gave a very poor representation of an intelligence officer. <laughs> I stood there with my mouth open. <coughs> I finally collected my wits and asked Herr Göring to step inside, which he did. And he came inside and he immediately launched complaints. He saw me arriving. He was curious about who I was, so he came knocking on the door to find out. He considered himself the, the president of the class. He was in charge, the number two Nazi elevated to number one. But the other prisoner, Grand Admiral Dönitz, had been selected by Hitler, the number one, to be his successor. And it was very interesting throughout our association for the next six months to see these two playing off against each other trying to be in control. The other prisoners didn't recognize Goering because he had be fallen into disfavor with Hitler toward the end. You probably have heard that story many times. And thanks to Bormann and Adolf Hitler, uh, Goering had been 
declassified once before, and Dönitz had been elevated. But Göring wasn't about to accept that, so he was still acting in charge, the president of the class, front row, center. Dönitz, who was a much more modest man, was in the last row in the picture, along with other members of the, the class. <clears throat> in this particular instance, Göring came right out and said, you're a young man. He said, what are you doing here? What is your job? And in my naivete, I was going to say, well, I'm an interrogation officer. I don't really know what my job is just yet. I haven't been told. But before I could say anything, he said, are you by any chance the welfare officer who's going to see to it that we all get a square deal and get treated properly according to the rules of Geneva Convention? And in a rare moment of intuition, I said, yes, that's my job. I'll see to it you get a square deal. That's all he wanted to know. He took it upon himself. <clears throat> Tell the other prisoners that at last the Americans had wised up. They brought somebody who was going to see to it that they all get proper treatment, like four-inch shoestrings in their boots. I reported that conversation to my superior officer, Major Sensenin, and told him. He said, that's great. He said, that's going to be your cover. First of all, you've got to use another name, because uh, I ended up having two brothers in the German army, one in Russia, the other one in North Africa. They had been shanghaied into the German army during the invasion of Luxembourg in 1940. So the assumption was that with two brothers in the German army, I shouldn't go by the name that they had. So I assumed the name Gillen, which was a good Luxembourg name. That was my cover, and I was to be the welfare officer. And I've always been grateful to Göring for suggesting this, because I got more information than anybody else. <laughs> <coughs> In addition to just having a routine interrogation, the other five interrogators, the other four and I, when we did the interrogation, it was based on the, the word, the questionnaire that we got from Justice Jackson's office. Certain prisoner, certain information, where was he at the Wednesday conference? Did he participate in this? Did he sign this document? And we would then decide at a staff meeting who would interrogate that particular prisoner, and that would be it. With the result that the other four interrogators actually got to know about maybe a dozen of the 80 Nazis. I got to know all of them because I made the rounds every day, and I visited them in their rooms. How are you today? How are you feeling? What's going on? I collected gossip, and they were full of it, telling me all about the shortcomings, the weaknesses of this guy and that guy, whom they didn't like among their entourage. And I kept file after file of all of the personal dirt that they fed me. And that turned out to be a very good thing. So I said, I got more information than anybody else. And I, I had been grateful to Goering, and I got to know all of the prisoners. But it also created another problem as far as the immediate future was concerned. So this was our function, to receive our questionnaires, to interrogate them, to get the answers, write up our reports. We also acted as interpreters and sometimes witnesses for visiting interrogation teams from other countries. The French, British, and Soviets would send interrogation teams, the Polish government, the Belgians, and we would sit in on those interrogations too. My other job was to be the liaison officer with the Luxembourg community because Fortunately, I had retained my mother tongue. I could still speak Luxembourgish. So it was part of my job to explain to the Luxembourgers in the community what was going on behind the barbed wire fence, that we were not treating these men in a luxurious hotel uh, with fine gloves, with kid gloves, that they were actually prisoners of war, declassified. We did not salute each other. We did not shake hands. We addressed them as Mr. Mr. Goering, Mr. Spare, Mr. Rosenberg, no military rank, no position in the government. They were declassified prisoners of war. Now, I don't know when you're going to ring the bell on me. Tell me when you, my time's up. Let me just pick a few of them to tell you about their, their personalities. What were these guys like? I need to tell you one more thing that I ended up 
being in addition to a welfare officer. We had brought in a prison psychiatrist, Douglas Kelly, who was a professor of psychiatry from the University of California. He was the world's expert on the Rorschach analysis test, the inkblot test. And he had been selected as a prison psychiatrist because Justice Jackson also wanted to know the IQs of these prisoners. He wanted to know, were they fit to stand trial? Were they insane, as was suspected in some cases, like uh, Rudolf Pess, uh, who didn't join us until we got to Nuremberg. But Robert Lai, the labor front leader, who acted very cruelly. Uh, Hans Frank, who had attempted suicide. Uh, Karl Brunner, who had had some problems. We wanted to know about their whole outlook, were they fit to stand trial, and more about their personalities. And the Rorschach test apparently was the best test to get the results and to find out their complete personality. The problem was that Major Kelly couldn't speak German. And somebody found out that I had majored in psychology at Miami University. So they tapped me to be the interpreter in the evening for Major Kelly in the administration of the inkblot test. And that turned out to be very rewarding from the standpoint of adventurism and getting to know more about the Nazis than was ordinarily revealed by gossip or by interrogation. So in addition to looking out for their welfare, <clears throat> going to visit their families, carrying messages back and forth, gathering intelligence in that fashion, I, I became the assistant psychiatrist interpreter for the prison psychiatrist. Meanwhile, I directed my efforts to getting away from it all because up to then, I had enough of Nazis. I didn't want anything more to do with them. So it became a struggle between my commanding officer and me, me trying to get away from there, he trying to keep me because he was a power, an empire builder too. So it was fun from that standpoint <laughs> to get to know these Nazis. Well, what were they like? When we got them all together in class of 45, a room full of blonde, blue-eyed Aryans, seven feet tall, supermensch, heron folk, the master race. Now, they looked just like anybody else. Some were short, some were tall, some were fat, some were skinny. Some were very bright, some were very stupid. They looked like anybody else. You get a group of people together, you got a little bit of everything. So the Nazis didn't live up to the heron folk, the master race concept at all in their physical appearance and in their behavior. Some were cowards, some were afraid, like Goering, who was afraid of thunder and lightning. Actually, one day I walked in his room during a thunderstorm because we knew about his weakness and found him cowered under his bunk. He was afraid of lightning. He also had a guilty conscience that probably contributed to it. Let me take Goering. And let me also say that in describing these people in one word, in our relationship, I would have to use the word irony. It seemed that almost every one of the contacts had some kind of an ironic twist. And, and I can think I can weave my story around the word irony, particularly in the case of Goering. He had a third highest IQ. The highest IQ was Jean Marchacht, the finance minister. Second highest, Arthur Seiss Inquart, the man who betrayed Austria. The third, Hermann Goering. He was intelligent. The lowest IQ was Julius Streicher, the Jew baiter. And he wasn't a moron, but he was pushing it pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> but Goering, <coughs> Goering had a marvelous personality. He was fun to be with. He had a terrific sense of humor when he wanted to show it or exercise it. And if he was in a good mood, he could entertain you. He actually had a joke book, a little black book in which he kept track of all the jokes being told in the underground in Germany about himself, about Hitler, and about other Nazis. And if he was in a good mood, he'd bring out his little book and tell you some of his jokes, some of them off color, but they were funny. They were always about the other guys and sometimes about himself. 
He could laugh at himself, even though he took himself very seriously and had an ego that you could stretch around the block. So he was charming. He had that. And he had a good sense of humor. He could laugh at himself. He was not a coward. He was an ace in World War I, commander of the von Richthofen squadron after von Richthofen uh, was killed. And he had been a member of that squadron. He was a German ace, which is why Hitler picked him to be the number two Nazi, because he was a front man, very much beloved and respected by the German people. But he was also a criminal, a man who was responsible for the formation of the SA, the black, the brown shirts, the SS, and the concentration camps. When he was in a bad mood, we avoided him, because he was in a black mood. He didn't want to talk. He didn't want to be seen. He didn't want to talk to anybody. And he had these mood swings, because he was a dope addict. He arrived at the prison with a shoebox full of paracodine tablets. He had been addicted to morphine, because during the time of the putsch, in 1923, he had been shot in the groin. In the course of his recovery, with the use of morphine, he became addicted to morphine. And during the years that he was the Reich Marshal and held all of the other ranks in the German government, the president of the Reichstag, periodically, every couple of years, he had to go to the tank to be dried out, to take the cure for his addiction. Consequently, he was chewing these paracodine tablets like M&Ms by the mouthful as part of his addiction. And he consumed, we estimated, from between 20 to 40 of those a day. He just had them in his pocket and just chewed on them. We broke them on the paracodine tablet. We broke him by reducing his dosage gradually, with his cooperation, by the way, with the result that he lost about 100 pounds during the first six months, he was our prisoner. When the trials got underway, he was in better health than he had, had been for years. Prison life was really good for his health, which he admitted in his own, with his own sense of humor. So Goering was an interesting person from that standpoint. Irony, where did it fit in? As I said, he was not accepted by the other prisoners. They tolerated him, but they didn't socialize much with him. So he spent a lot of time by himself. He had his meals in a dining room, mostly by himself. He sat at the table. One day I was a duty officer, standing next to his table, when a German PW, I mentioned the cooks and bakers, ordinary soldiers, brought a plate of stew on a heavy porcelain dish. No knives or forks permitted, only spoons. He set the dish in front of Goering. Goering looked at it rather disdainfully. Then he shoved it aside and said to this PW, take that slop away. I fed my dog much better than that back home. But this PW was quite hep to the situation. He took the plate of stew. He stepped back, clicked his heels and bowed. He said, in that case, Herr Reismarschall, your dog ate much better than we German soldiers did. <coughs> That's ironic. Six months earlier, that man would have lost his head for his impudence of talking that way to the Marshal of the Third Reich. But this time, he got away with it. Irony. The reason my book is named Pattern of Circles is because, as Mr. Peeves already pointed out, uh, how I came to be here through a pattern of circles. Forty years later, after Mundorf, I was the American ambassador to Luxembourg. And the people in Mundorf decided that uh, they wanted to honor me. They knew about my background. So I became an honorary citizen of Mundorf, which is quite nice. I can drive as fast as I want to Mundorf. <laughs> <laughs> and I can have a free beer in a parking space anytime. <laughs> but it was quite an honor. And, and they made a big show of it, like the Luxembourgers love a celebration. And Winnie, my wife, and I, driven up in our embassy car, the American flag on the fender, embassy flag on the other fender, up to the town hall, and the mayor with red, white, and blue sash, and the members of the town council, and Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the village band, school children, the little American flags. It's quite an event. And distinguished guests were introduced. And I was introduced to one man who was presented as a former 
prisoner of war at the detention center, Ashcan. He was a German from Koblenz, and he was introduced to me too. And he had written a paper about the American ambassador who had been an interrogator at Ashcan, and so he <coughs> approached the city government and asked if he could come and, and meet me. Well, he didn't know Dollar Boy, he did know McGillen. So he was surprised when he found out who this guy Dollar Boy really was. And we had a chance to chat. And in the course of our chatting, he, he said, uh, Mr. Ambassador, he said, uh, do you remember one time when you were the duty officer and a German PW brought the plate of stew and set it before Goering, and Goering sent it back to the kitchen? And I said, yes, I remember that. He says, that was me. Who those people was pattern of circles 40 years later? Well, coming back to Goering, that was the, the irony, the ironic twist uh, in this connection. Let me take another character, Julius Streicher, the Jew baiter. On one hand, uh, as I mentioned earlier to someone in our, our conversation, the most uh, exciting person to interrogate was Goering, the Reich Marshal, seven-star general, uh, the president of the Reichstag, the ace of World War I. The most interesting from the standpoint of psychology was this man Streicher, the Jew baiter. The word race, Rasse, is the German word for race. Hasse is the German word for hate. And Streicher made quite an issue of that. He fancied himself as being the hate monger of first degree, the hater of the Jews, who hated the Jews with a passion. You could talk to Streicher for three minutes without his going into an anti-Semitic tirade. He published his pornographic anti-Semitic newspaper, which had exposés of, of, of the Jews, all kinds of stories, pornographic, the word go. He hated Jews by his own explanation because when he was a boy, five years old, a traveling salesman had come to his house selling material, goods, and his mother ordered some material to make a suit for his father. And she bought this material, ordered it, paid for it, and when it arrived, three weeks later, it was of inferior quality and was short measure, not as much as she had ordered. So he heard the word Yuda, Jew, for the first time from the mouth of his mother when he was five years old. My mother felt herself betrayed, he said, and we children cried with her. Then he went to school, and he studied the Bible, and he learned what the Jews had done to Jesus, and they crucified him, and he ended up hating them. He went in the army in World War I, and the Jews always got the better jobs and the promotions. And then he became a school teacher, elementary school teacher, and all the Jews in the school were promoted and he wasn't. So it was always the Jewish fault. He hated the Jews. Limited intelligence. His IQ was 106. But he could talk about the Jewish religion, the Jewish culture, the Jewish people, Jewish history with finesse. He really was an expert. And you wondered how this man of limited intelligence could become so well informed and retained so much. And we learned that he kept a library called the Sturmont Bibliothek. Wherever the German troops went, into Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, into Belgium, France, Netherlands, Luxembourg, they burned down schools, synagogues, libraries, and millions of books. But they had orders to bring back the best samples of Jewish literature, manuscripts, books, about the Jews and to bring them to the Sturmer Bibliothek. So Streicher collected a private library of Jewish literature. Every book document collected from all parts of Europe about the Jews, for the Jews, by the Jews was in his private collection. He read and studied this material, then he would distort it and use it in his anti-Semitic speeches and his books and his publications. Well, we became curious about this library. 
We located it in a basement of an old warehouse that had been bombed out. And I wish I could tell you how it felt to, to see this collection of books, undoubtedly the most valuable private collection in the world. As I said, every book written by the Jews, for the Jews, about the Jews, collected by the one man who has given his life to wipe out Jewish culture with every intention of doing it not only in Germany, but in all of Europe, the rest of the world. He's the only one who has preserved that aspect of Jewish culture. If it hadn't been for Julius Streicher, those books and documents and manuscripts would have been burnt like the rest, everything that the Nazis destroyed. That's irony. Rosenberg, the Nazi philosopher, who wrote the second bestseller, the bestseller, and I took it to Rosenberg in the course of one of our visits, and I asked him to autograph it for me. He grabbed the book, held it behind his back. He said, I can't let you have this. And I said, why not? He says, well, he said, in the months we've been together, I find that you're a good Christian, or you're a good soldier, or you're a loyal American. And if you read my book, your eyes will be open, and you'll no longer believe as you do. You no, no longer will follow as you follow. And your whole philosophy will change. And I don't want that on my conscience, so I don't want you to read my book. I'm thinking quite a lot of his book. <laughs> but I, I promised him that, that I would never read it. I would just keep it as a souvenir. And so he, he autographed it for me. And I kept my promise. I never read it. It's a, a wild podge of anti-Semitism, anti-Christianity, anti-everything that's decent and good that we as Americans respect and believe in. Baldo Bacchira, the Hitler youth leader, told me that uh, Rosenberg wrote the only book that became a bestseller that nobody ever read. And I read it. So, so at least that day. Well, <clears throat> I wish I had the time. Uh, I, I do want to allow you some time for some questions because I'm sure there's some things you, you'd like to know about that I haven't even touched on. But I do have an anecdote about just about every one of these Nazis that I got to know quite well in 1945. After the seventh, two planes, and you saw just an inkling of the life. They were now in solitary confinement to be tried in the first session of the tribunal. Lai wrote a note. I didn't go to Nuremberg with him. I was sent to Oberursel, the Military Intelligence Service Center, to do a study on the history of the German general staff when a note arrived from Lies saying that he had some very important information that he would give only to me, the welfare officer, and I should come to visit him at Nuremberg. So I was given six days temporary duty to go to Nuremberg to get this important information from Lie. As it turned out, two things went wrong. One, the information that Lie had was a crazy, wild scheme he had for the reconstruction of Germany with himself in charge. And he would bring back to Germany all the Jews that had been kicked out or left in Germany as refugees. And he would bring them back. And under his jurisdiction, they would help him in the Arbeitsfront to reorganize and reconstruct Germany and make up for the anti-Semitism, which had been the big mistake of Nazism. That was his plan and he would give it only to me. I was to translate that, and I presented it to, to Colonel Amon, who was the deputy to Justice Jackson. I don't know whether Justice Jackson ever read it, but Colonel Amon called me in the next day and said, this is crazy. We're naturally not even going to send this on through channels. If he had, they'd still be going through channels anyway. <laughs> so I had to tell Lai that his scheme wasn't going to work. And consequently, he, he, he panicked. He had been shot down as a navigator in World War I and had a very severe head injury, a damaged brain, which resulted in his stuttering. He stammered whenever he talked. And the first time I ever interviewed him in Luxembourg and, and just asked the routine question to fill out a form, what is your name, your full name, he stammered. He stuttered in giving me a reply, and I thought he was trying to be a smart aleck. And I reprimanded him, and he pointed out that he apologized, that he, this was a legitimate stammer, and he explained how he got it. 
And I said, now look, uh, I've heard you on the radio, I've heard you give your speeches, and you're a rabble rouser. Uh, you give some dynamic speeches, how could you do that? And then stutter. Ah, he said, uh, I always have a little bit of whiskey to loosen my tongue. He said, if you give me some of that good American bourbon, I think I could speak more freely to you. <laughs> I learned out later from him and from others that every time he gave a speech in public, he was soused. <laughs> he was bombed. And he was one of the chief spokesmen for Hitler, a rabbit rouser supreme, who was drunk every time he appeared in public. That gives you some idea of the quality of leadership. <clears throat> Light decided he had nothing to live for. Subsequently, he committed suicide. He strangled himself, and I won't go into the details, but unfortunately, the second bad aspect was I was on duty. The night he committed suicide, and he wrapped a towel, uh, the strong end of a towel that he had ripped, wrapped around his neck, even though he had him on a 24-hour guard. But he was able to sit on the toilet, which was part of the cell. It was a niche, and within that niche was a toilet so that they would have some privacy from the guard who was watching him 24 hours a day. And he slipped that noose over the standpipe where the flush button was, gagged, he, he actually tore up his underwear, put it in his mouth so he wouldn't make any noise, and literally strangled himself to death. He was just the right height. If he had been an inch taller or an inch shorter, it wouldn't have worked. He had that all worked out. So he was the first of the 22 to commit suicide. The second, of course, was Goering, who produced a capsule of potassium cyanide with which he took his life one hour before he was to be hanged. Ben Swearingen, whose picture you saw at the beginning there, wrote the mystery of Hermann Goering's suicide. I know Ben Swearingen. We met in Dallas, Texas, when I gave a talk to the Dallas Women's Club. And uh, he incidentally has, I, I gave him a Rosenberg book with Rosenberg autograph, because he was a collector of Nazi memorabilia. I'm not, I didn't want any Nazi stuff in my house, so I collected nothing, stupid. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a business nowadays, you can make money, but I lost out on that one. But Ben Swearingen wrote the, took a, made a study of the mystery of Hermann Goering's suicide, and he based it on a capsule, a cartridge, which Goering had used to store the potassium cyanide in a jar of cold cream. And I think there have been many theories, but I think Swearingen came up with the right one. He did a lot of good research on it and wrote an interesting book on how Goering managed to beat the hangman. Because Goering would tell us time and again, you'll never hang me. And we'd say to ourselves, listen, fat stuff, anybody <laughs> hangs <laughs> to you. And he was right, we didn't hang him. He cheated the hangman. He had two other capsules of cyanide on him when he was taken prison. He had one buried in a cigarette and another one buried in one of those paracodine tablets. We found those, but we didn't find a third in a jar of cold cream, which is kept in storage. Well, the trial, of course, is knowledge. You've seen a lot of films, you've seen a lot of pictures. You know, if they were tried, it took 10 months to try them, with Justice Jackson as the chief prosecutor. The other bad part of my visiting life for six days was that Colonel Andrews who had been the warden of the prison in Luxembourg, had taken a liking to me, mostly because I could speak Luxembourgish and I knew where he could get um, fundado brandy and other things in Luxembourg after the war. So he wanted me to be with him in Nuremberg and he pulled strings. And when I got to Nuremberg to interview Lai, I ended up being stuck in Nuremberg because Andrews wanted to keep me there. And I frankly confess, I was sick and tired of Nazis. I wanted to get, get home. So I pulled all the strings I could back with the military intelligence headquarters to get me out of there before I'd have a nervous breakdown, which I could have had if I'd stayed there much longer. So it was a struggle for several months, during which I tried to get away from Nuremberg, and Colonel Andrews tried to keep me as his special assistant. We weren't doing any more interrogating when they got to Nuremberg. But as a special assistant, I visited their families, and I worked with 
Major Kelly, the psychiatrist, and I visited the prisoners to inquire about their welfare and their state of mind and to keep them in good spirits. They gave me some German tobacco and German cigarettes to help keep up their morale. Anybody could smoke that stuff and keep up his morale with it. <laughs> had a job on his hand. <clears throat> well, I, I worked for, for about two and a half months. During that time, I had the occasion to sit in on uh, several sessions of the trials which had begun uh, by November and saw Justice Jackson in action. Uh, I was in the session as a spectator, just sat out where nobody could see me. Because after the trials began, it was not a good idea to, to uh, visit the, the Nazis in their cells anymore because some of the information that we brought to light was being used as part of the, the uh, information at the trials. And so it would have been politic to, to try to uh, negotiate with them on a welfare officer basis. But I did visit their families. And a human aspect, coming back to this man Streicher, that I, I, it stuck with me that I, I want to share with you. His wife Adele, who had been his secretary, he was exiled actually to his farm, the Pleikershof in Nuremberg, where he continued some of his anti-Semitic activity, but he was no longer active in the party. And when the, German, the Americans invaded, and uh, the, it looked like uh, the end of the war, Streicher and his secretary decided to get married. So he married his secretary, and they were going to commit suicide because they, they couldn't witness the surrender of Germany to the American forces. So they actually dug a grave, this is his story, dug two graves, and then they were going to shoot each other and drop in the graves and, and cheat the, the Americans who were going to try to take them prisoner. But then they decided, or rather they decided not to commit suicide. So they went to the Tyrol in Austria, and he developed a black patch over his eye, and he let his hair grow, uh, he always kept it shaven. He let his hair grow and grew a beard and wore lederhosen and pretended to be an, a Tyroler, an Austrian, living in the mountains, yodeling. <laughs> a Jewish lieutenant was taken prisoner and brought to Luxembourg eventually. Well, <clears throat> very interesting then to, to see uh, Streicher in this particular incident, to learn more about him from the others who all hated him. They didn't want to eat in the same dining room with him. And we thought part of their punishment was to make them eat with Streicher in the dining room in, in Luxembourg. When his wife Adele came to visit him, they, they were not allowed visits until after the trial, uh, during the month between the trial and the, and the uh, execution. But his wife did come to the prison. And I remember she brought him a shirt and a pipe. And he, I told him that his wife was here. What did he want me to tell her? And here's this man responsible morally for the death of millions of Jews, for the hatred that he spewed, that he in, incited. A man who was an unpleasant character to be with. I wouldn't want him for a friend even if he begged me or bribed me. But I told him that his wife was there, what should I tell her? And he said, tell her to visit the children who are orphans. Go to the hospitals, visit the poor, and do good. Take them food and clothing. And I, I took that with a bit of suspicion, but I was going to honestly deliver the message. Then he came toward me and put his hand on my arm. And for a mo moment I was so shocked that I didn't know what to do. I couldn't very well say, get your hands off. But he put his hand on my, my upper arm and he held it there for a few seconds. And then he took it away and he said, when you see Adele, please tell her to put her hand in the same place on your arm so we could be close to each other. Now here's a murderer, a man who's going to be sentenced to death for crimes against humanity. But it was that little human touch that was exhibited in that gesture. And that was true with a lot of these men. Some were repentant, confessed. Hans Frank, the butcher of Poland, who I said confessed to the responsibility for the murder of two and a half million Jews. Balder von Schirach was sorry. Albert Speer regretted. He said he'd actually tried to assassinate Hitler toward the end of the war, but hadn't succeeded. I didn't believe that one, but it sounded good. 
but at least he was sorry for his sin. So there were some who regretted and apologized. And then there were a larger number who said, we just did our duty. We obeyed orders. We did what we were told to do. This, of course, is truly a, the case in the military. And then of course, there was the other extreme, like Sauko and Streicher and Kaltenbrunner, who uh, were the fanatics whose last words before the noose was tightened around their necks were Heil Hitler and long live the Third Reich. So you had a perfectly normal curve of those who were sorry, those who admitted their guilt, or those who tried to cover up. I didn't know anything about it. I was a ski instructor in the mountains. Bruce Hershenson ran for the Senate of California and wrote a book, an article rather, and the title of it was, A Nation with 300,000 Ski Instructors. <laughs> Everybody was a ski instructor. We didn't know anything about this. And then, of course, you had those who were sorry, who were fanatics to the end. Well, I do want to close my remarks by saying that 21, 21 were tried, Borman, in absentia. His remains were found some years later and identified uh, when they were digging new railroad tracks in Berlin, just about 300 yards from the rice bunker. He was killed in a war by artillery or, or something. So his remains were identified. But he was tried in absentia and found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. Eleven were sentenced to death. Goering committed suicide, cheated the hangman. The other ten were hanged. Three were acquitted. Fritzsche, the propaganda minister, who I like to say was sort of the Walter Cronkite of, of Germany during the Third Reich. He was a radio personality who propagandized for the Nazi regime, but Really, that wasn't a crime. It was just bad taste. And then there was uh, Fritzsche, Schaumarschacht, and von Papen, the former chancellor of Germany and vice chancellor under Hitler, who again had served Hitler as ambassador to Austria, ambassador to, uh, to um, somewhere else, Cyprus, I think. But that, again, wasn't a crime in itself. So he was acquitted. Although I think if we had dug deeply enough we probably could have, could have found him guilty of something. The others received prison sentences, ranging from 10 years for Dönitz to life imprisonment for Rudolf Hess. Hess, I hadn't even mentioned him. Now, he didn't come to Nuremberg, uh, to Luxembourg. I met him for the first time in Nuremberg. But uh, ask me a question about Hess. It takes 45 minutes, and I don't want to talk any longer. <laughs> <laughs> but Hess was interesting. Let me just say this. I want to quote Ronald Reagan, who came to Europe during our embassy days. When he came to Bitburg, you remember that famous Bitburg visit that everybody criticized? I was very much involved in that. And you have to read my book to find out about that. <laughs> because Arthur Burns, who was our ambassador to Germany, passed the buck to me. Because he couldn't very well interfere with a state visit and discourage Reagan from visiting an American military cemetery in Bitburg, where 49 Waffen SS men were buried. So Arthur Burns asked me to convince Reagan not to go to the cemetery in Bitburg. Well, I was, wasn't too well informed, because I was a political appointee, and I had access to Reagan uh, through the, what we call the, uh, the White House signal as a special a telephone line that ambassadors could use to talk to the president or the vice president. But I didn't have enough nerve to tell the president to change his schedule and not to go to the cemetery at Bitburg. So I, I weakened on that one. I did send a cable, but it went through the State Department and some deputy desk officer probably threw it in the wastebasket. So he never got my advice. But we did go to Bitburg to visit him. And we witnessed his speech to the German and, of course, our own Allied troops at the Air Force Base. And I'd like to close my uh, storytelling by quoting President Reagan and explaining why I'm here. He said, the one lesson of World War II, the one lesson of Nazism, is that freedom must always be stronger than totalitarianism, and that good must always be stronger than evil. Now, the crimes and wars of yesterday cannot be undone. 
nor can we call the millions who died back to life. But we can learn something from the past and use the lessons we have learned to make a better future. And that's what I'm trying to do, to keep history straight, to share this experience from the past. There's much more. It's all in my book. Just go ahead and buy it. <laughs> Thank you very much.